it's absolutely clear that we have a risen Christ in view. Revelation 1.18. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So absolutely clear we have a risen Christ in view. Number two, it's also clear there's a sequence implied. I died, I am now alive again forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. One, two, three. This follows that. Now, third, and this is important, this suggests, both the risen Christ and the sequence that's implied suggests that before Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't have the keys to death in Hades. Somebody else did. And what these sources, especially you know, Bass, are going to argue is that Jesus descended into the underworld at death. I died. He was there three days, during which time he did certain things. We've talked about this before, Unseen Realm. We talk about 1 Peter 3 with this, the descent in, in, you know, into Sheol, into the underworld. So he's there three days during which time he did certain things, one of which being that he conquered death and Hades, personified as supernatural enemies. And he took the keys from their domain, from their hands, as it were, rising from the dead. Now, after he rises, now he is Lord of the living and the dead. He holds the power of life and death. Something Revelation will make quite clear in judgment scenes later in the book that involve the second death. So consequently, what Revelation 1.18 is describing is Christ's descent into the underworld, his combat with or, and victory over death and Hades. This would have been crystal clear to ancient again, literate readers. And the history of the church in this regard is, is, is telling. Here's the fourth point. Bass points out in detail that the idea that Christ descended into the underworld, descended into hell is the more familiar language through something like the Apostles' Creed, that this idea was a belief embraced by the confessing church across the world until the late 1400s early 1500s. Everybody believed this. Everybody got it. And if you were an ancient reader, you, you know, again, the, the supernatural outlook of all this in terms of the you know, spiritual warfare and the, you know, conquering supernatural agents and again, taking the keys from them, you know what it means. But, you know, we, we may have lost the detail in the history of the church, but we didn't, we didn't lose the point, at least up until, you know, just right before the Reformation. Now, I think one of the reasons that it is so, you know, it, it's so obvious. I mean, when you see it, when you hear, you know, when you talk about it, when you think about it, and, and especially if you know the backgrounding of the Old Testament, Second Temple record, I mean, this is just obvious. That doesn't mean that Jesus went to hell as, as in he gets a cell where he's going to be punished. See, that, that's the obstacle for a lot of readers today. He died. He goes to the place where the dead go, the underworld. We have to think of, of that, that place in that way. Again, what could be more obvious? But he doesn't remain there. He descended to hell, descended to the underworld is the better way to think about it, to the realm where the dead go. Well, duh, if he died, then where else would he go? Yeah, exactly. It's quite obvious. And again, everybody, everybody was locked in until you know the late 1400s, okay? So this adds weight to you know, what I'm articulating in Unseen Realm on 1 Peter 3, where there I talk about how Enoch was a type of Christ in his descent. So not only does Christ preach to the imprisoned watcher spirits, reiterating their doom, but he also takes the lunch money from death in Hades. Okay, he's got stuff to do when he, when he goes down to the underworld. First, I got to tell the watchers you ain't getting out, or, you know, you might have think you've won after all, after all this time, and, you know, you, your buddy is somewhere, some other evil spirit's going to let you out of here. Well, I got news for you. Yeah, you might be surprised to see me here, but I ain't going to be here long. You still lose, <laughs> okay? And, you know, okay, mission accomplished here. My work here is done. Now I'm going to go over to the gatekeepers, okay, death and Hades, and I'm going to take the keys from them, and sayonara. I mean, I'm, I'm out of here. You know, the, the, he does certain things, you know. The, and again, the early church, you, you could, you could, Bass does a really nice job of, of, of showing this. They're locked into this. This wouldn't be news to them. 
but but in our day and age, you know, we've we've had a history of you know this or that tradition or denomination, maybe even some that have removed the line from the Apostles' Creed, or fiddled with the language or or taught against it or something like that. They they just missed the point. They and and they just like with First Peter three, they 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 in some way kind of eviscerate the passage of its intended meaning. When Christ takes the keys, he takes control of everlasting life or death through his resurrection victory. What could be more obvious? 